encounters between Jesus and various people. First, a conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a religious insider who snuck in to speak with Jesus under the cover of darkness. And then a Samaritan woman, a stranger, an outsider, one who did not get on with Jews, who met Jesus in broad daylight by a well where Jesus offered her living water. And now this morning we are introduced to a man born blind, so that he lives in his own darkness, though it be broad daylight. He sits outside the gates, and that's where Jesus found him. Let us hear the story in the man's own words. I was just sitting there, hoping my neighbors might be feeling generous that day. I had a couple of coins in my cup to clink together, barely enough to buy a bit of bread, but enough to get the attention of the passers-by. It being the Sabbath, I was feeling optimistic. <coughs> Folks always gave more on the Sabbath, although my need was just as great the other six days of the week. They would pass by on their way to or from the temple, stirring up the dust where I sat, and toss a coin my way in hopes that their act of charity might put them in a good way with God. I often wished I could look those people in the eye, wished I could stop them in their tracks with a piercing gaze, because I wanted more than anything else for them to look at me, to really see me, not just the cup in my hands or the holes in my robe, not just my bowed head, but me, a person, alive and breathing, a person who laughs and cries, feels frustration and joy, fatigue, oh yes, and hope and hunger, just like every other person. In the Torah, in the book of Genesis, it says that people are made in the image of God. Then God said, let us make God, let us make humankind in our image, according to our own likeness. That's chapter 1, verse 26. I know, because I've listened from a distance as the scroll was being read in the temple. And I've wondered about that wondered whether it really meant some of us are made in God's image. It seems like that's what the Pharisees think. Otherwise, wouldn't they have been more inclined to notice me? I may not have been able to read Holy Scripture, but my hearing was just fine. I know what I heard. And so I wondered. I had plenty of time to wonder. I was born blind. I don't know why. It just happened that way. My parents say I was an otherwise healthy baby with a, a lusty cry and a, a big appetite. It's just my eyes that didn't work. Still, everyone assumed that it must have been something I did. Some terrible offense carried out against God while I was still being knit together in my mother's womb or some unspeakable offense committed by my parents. <coughs> Honestly, I've never felt any more or less sinful than the next person. I just feel like me. So sometimes when people ask me what I did to be blind, I ask them, well, what did you do to end up with eyes that see? It wasn't being blind that ruined me. It was how people judged me because of my blindness. I could have worked if only someone had given me the chance. 
My arms, my back, my legs, they're strong enough. I can haul water and push a cart. When I was little, I used to bake bread with my mother. I loved kneading the dough, the warm, silky feel of it under my fingers and palms and the aroma as it baked. Ah, but who would buy bread from a blind baker? I am considered cursed. So there I sat with my begging cup, listening to my clinking coins, to the shuffling of sandals, to the, the bray of a donkey, the creaking of wagon wheels, the cry of vendors, when I heard a man speaking, somewhere off to my left, he spoke with authority. And I wondered whether he might be a visiting rabbi. I knew he was a stranger because I'd never heard his voice before. And I've been sitting in this town square long enough to recognize every distinctive voice. That's what got my attention. But then I realized he was speaking about me. And what he was saying was extraordinary. That neither I nor my parents were responsible for my blindness. That God's works were being revealed in me. God's works in me. And for a moment, I wondered whether my hearing was going the way of my sight, because never before had I heard anyone suggest that I was anything but a broken and worthless sinner. And then the man approached me, got, got right down in the dirt next to me. He was so close, I could feel his breath on my face. I could smell the sweat on his body. I heard his fingers scraping in the dirt, heard him spit and then knead the dust, and all I could think was, he is breaking Sabbath law. Everyone knew that kneading, whether bread or dirt, was prohibited on the Sabbath. But before I could protest, before I could ask the man to please step away, lest I be accused along with him and banished from the temple grounds, he cupped my face between his calloused hands. Hands of a laborer, I thought. A, a carpenter, maybe. So not a rabbi, after all? And rubbed the mud onto my eyelids. Now, I have been spat at. I have had dirt kicked in my face. But here was this man smearing dirt and spittle on my eyes, and I realized I couldn't remember the last time I had been touched like that. Touched at all, for that matter, by anyone other than my mother. His hands, they were firm and gentle, and his actions deliberate so that I found I trusted this stranger implicitly. When he told me to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, I went without question. What happened next is indescribable. I found my way to the pool. I knelt down and washed away that mud that coated my eyelids, and when I stood, I was overwhelmed by a strange and unfamiliar sensation, a sensation that I realized with astonishment, with sight. I could see. I could see the pool of Siloam and the road and that braying donkey and the creaking wheels on the cart and my own cup abandoned on the ground a little way from where I stood. I could also see all those people walking to and from the temple. And I stumbled back to my cup, still disoriented by this new world of sight. And I looked all around for the stranger who had worked this wonder, but nowhere could I pick out his distinctive voice. 
Instead, I found myself surrounded by neighbors, neighbors even more bewildered than I at my newfound condition. Who are you? They asked. It's me, I said. It's still me. But they only looked at me with expressions that I soon came to recognize as disbelief and disdain. And then came the Pharisees, as baffled and frankly belligerent as the others. And no matter how many times I told them my tale, they could not seem to believe me. Don't you see, I said to them, he put mud on my eyes and he told me to wash and now I see. Ironic that I should have my sight restored only to be denied and dismissed yet again. Ironic that the one thing I could see most clearly was the very thing that remained somehow imperceptible to these religious officials, that the man, rabbi, carpenter, I still didn't know which, and it hardly mattered, that that man was clearly a man of God, a prophet. I, I say all of the Pharisees, but it's not entirely true. There was this one Pharisee with a deep crease on his forehead, like he was working out some difficult calculus in his head, like he was torn between two opposing views. And he said, how can a man who is a sinner perform signs such as these? He asked it of the others, and I seized the opportunity to chime in exactly Never once in the world's history has it been heard that anyone had their eyes opened by one such as this. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. In the end, the Pharisees were not swayed. My testimony meant nothing to them because I meant nothing to them. I was still just the blind beggar, mired in some unknown sin, raised on the wrong side of the tracks with none of their scholarly credentials. My clothes were too baggy. My sun-baked face was too dark. My speech was too coarse. And they shifted nervously and held their coin purses close as though I was not just a beggar, but perhaps a thief, some kind of con. In the end, they threw me out of the temple like I couldn't possibly know what I was talking about, like I was the one who had committed some offense and not the person who had been healed. Discouraged, angry, unsure what to do next, I returned to my spot outside the gate. Where else was I to go? And that's where Jesus found me. I should have known him right away, but I guess I was overwhelmed by the events of the day. He asked me whether I believed in the human one. And assuming he must be talking about that man of God, the one with the calloused hands and the gentle touch who had changed my life and caused such a stir, I looked him in the eye. I looked him in the eye. And I said, tell me, so that I may believe in him. And that's when it all clicked into place. The sound of his voice the powerful, tender look in his eyes, the smile. So I knew, even as he said it, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. I believe, I said. Oh yes, I believe. The funny thing is, I would have said so, even if my eyes had not been fixed. Because this man, 
Jesus restored my sight. When he did that, it was really the second of two wonders that he performed that day. The first was that he noticed me at all. That he saw God at work in me, a blind beggar. My whole life I had been ignored, object of ridicule and theological debate, but never the subject of someone's genuine interest. And then along came this man and told me what I had always suspected, but what I had longed to hear confirmed, that the Spirit of God is in me, that I am whole and precious and always have been. Now that Spirit is shining right out through my opened eyes so that others can see it too. Now I can see all the other precious things and people in God's creation. Now I can look my neighbors in the eye. I can stop them in their tracks with my piercing gaze. And with my eyes and with my words, I can spread the news, the incredible good news, that this God of ours, the one who created us in God's own image, the one who shaped us out of clay with loving hands and breathed into us the breath of life, that God is alive and at work and shining through the life and the ministry of this carpenter, teacher, prophet, rabbi, this man, Jesus. I don't know what you think, but it seems to me that the Pharisees and a few others are missing the point when they spend all their time pointing fingers and blaming suffering on sin when they scour the crowds to find all the pure and perfect people to serve in the temple and congratulate themselves for throwing the rest of us a few coins. I'm beginning to wonder if they're actually reading those holy scriptures that they hold so dear. After all, didn't Father Moses, who led our people out of exile, suffer from a stutter? Didn't Jacob limp for most of his life? Wasn't Sarah barren and Abraham way too old? And maybe, maybe that's why God chose them in the first place. Because they understood struggle. Because they had cultivated strength and faith in the face of suffering and disappointment. Or maybe, just maybe, our own ideas about perfection are just completely off base. Maybe God, who works through a blind beggar, works in all of us, rejoices in each of us, just as we are, whole and precious. All I know is I was blind, and then Jesus saw me. To God be the glory. Amen.